five minutes' time. Now, the time is 13 minutes past six. The Battle of the Somme might be known as one of the bloodiest battles ever fought, but not much is known about the strategy of the British generals and the intelligence they had before they sent millions of men to the front line, many of whom never returned. Yeah, the historian uh, Hugh Sebag Montefiore's new book explores how prepared the military was before going into battle and includes first hand accounts from soldiers whose stories have never been told before. Hugh joins us here on Breakfast morning. this morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hi. On what a day, this, this day, the 1st of July, just, just seeing the pictures and, and the vigils overnight, it, it, it gives you a lump of the throat. Yeah, it's it? very moving. Yeah, really is. And rightly so. I mean, mm. we, we understand more than. One million lives were lost on yes. both sides. And you've particularly taken a look at the strategy employed. And some interesting, I mean, when we were reading our briefing notes, mm. some really interesting, um, a lack of intelligence or a misuse of intelligence by our generals on that day. W would you like to give us a few examples? Yes, well, um, before, the, before the battle started, uh, prisoners were captured by both sides. And the prisoners captured by the British told them that there was effectively a gap at the south end of the British line, which was not very well protected because the dugouts had all been burst in and the soldiers were demoralised. There was basically an open goal waiting to be attacked there. And what's, what's astonishing is that with this intelligence, no steps were taken by the generals in charge, Haig and Rawlinson, to concentrate on that area. They just attacked the whole front. This may be because the head intelligence officer gave a summary before the attack that the whole front was open, that there was going to be no problem anywhere. But the particular intelligence reports that were handed down, actually seen by Haig, because he actually comments on, on them in his diary, did say that there was this, o this open goal in the south. And if the intelligence had been more closely monitored and responded to, do you think it could have been very different? Do you think that this day, this date, would not be remembered as being as disastrous as it was? I think a, a modern general, with the experience of what happened in the Israeli wars and the German blitzkrieg, I think they would have taken a very different approach to the intelligence they had. They would have maybe done a demonstration down the whole line to keep the Germans occupied, to stop them all concentrating in this southern area but they would have gone through the southern area, gone round the back, and um, they, would have, they might have even broken through and actually won the war. There were simple mistakes, though, weren't there? Simply like a phone call, I understand, that was made to the generals wishing them luck, that was tapped. Yes, I mean, the British knew that the phones were being tapped. They had no excuse for having a phone call on the morning of the attack, about three in the morning, this phone call went through, wishing the troops good luck and saying, when you get through, uh, make sure you stay where you are because the re reinforcements are going to come up and the artillery, the artillery will support you. And this was read by the Germans and then distributed very, very quickly right across the front. If you look through the German archives, you can see every single unit has got a note saying the attack's about to happen. And we were saying, we were mentioning the fact that you've, you've been looking very much at the personal testimonies and the stories of, of the men who are there or on the ground, and some of which have... have not really been recorded before, which, you know, after all this time, you imagine that all the archives have been exhausted. But, but what have you found? What are the things, the stories that, that will stay with you most? Well, there are some very, very sad stories. I mean, it's particularly about the, the, missing, the missing soldiers, soldiers who the parents had to find out what happened to them. And sometimes they waited months to find out. But on the first day, I, I particularly mentioned one that was um, the Newfoundland Regiment, of quite a famous they attacked Beaumont Hamel, one of the most famous places now on the, west, on, the, on the Somme front. And the parents found out about, um, about 18 days after the attack, they wrote thinking that their son had survived because no mention had come through on the lists of, of, of the people who died that was being pinned up in the post offices in St John's in Newfoundland. They wrote letters to this, this boy who was, who was in fact dead. And the, the, the letters are very moving. I mean, I could, I could quote from them if you would like, but we probably don't have time. No. But, but they said things like, the mum says things like, uh, you always said good news, no news was good news. I'm sure, you know, we hope you're alive, that your grandpa's been so upset. And the grandpa wrote, you know, moving letters about, you know, about how he heard about the battle, but he just hoped he was OK. And then um, a week later, the parents found out and they, they got sent back the envelope 
full of, with a letter still unopened in it, and on the front of the envelope it says in red letters, dead. And that's how they heard. No? That's, that's the, that, so that's, brutal, yeah, isn't it? It is. Hugh, thank you so much for now. Uh, I think you're going to speak to us again a bit later, and we'll have full coverage throughout the morning. For now, thank you very much indeed. And Hugh's book uh, is called Somme Into the Breach, and a reminder at 7 o'clock this morning, uh, for 45 minutes, we'll hand to Hugh Edwards and Kirsty Young for live coverage of the Somme commemorations uh, here in the UK and in France as well.